course. So now we will start with Hans Drexler. Hans studied in Darmstadt, Zurich, Frankfurt, London, and Berlin. He founded DG, D, DGJ Architecture in 1999 together with Mark Kinnant and Daniel Joslin. He is currently a member of the board of curators of EBA 27 Stat Region Stuttgart. In the last 20 years of practical experience in all design stages, DG, DG, sorry, <laughs> DG, DGJ Architecture completed 30 successful participants participations in competitions and 25 completed buildings, of which 12 received prizes and awards. In 2014, he has designed the first state-owned plus energy house in Hess for a boarding school, which is a model project for the federal research program Ephesian House Plus. Uh, they also have works in the modernization and energetic transformation of existing buildings. The passive house renovation of a residential building in Bonn received an award from Wussenrot Foundation. So, house. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I ah. hope you can hear me. Perfect, yes. Okay, super. So, now, hence the, the stage is yours. Go ahead, thank you. Okay. Um, Jakos, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really excited to be part of this conference and I had the chance to listen to some of the lectures uh, today and yesterday and uh, yes, I'm really excited to be here and I think it's a very important topic that you're uh, addressing with this conference and I'm happy to be a part of it. Um, I would share the screen now and um, I would like to uh, talk to you today about uh, the means and the ends of architecture, because to me that is uh, um, an important uh, distinction between those two things, uh, especially in the context of uh, high tech and low tech uh, technology and architecture. Um, I already, um, Tiago already covered some of what we're doing in DGJ um, with the introduction. Um, one important aspect of the work of DGJ I would like to um, add is that our office really um, is set apart from some other offices uh, in that we're not only doing practical work like building and designing in the uh, different fields, but we're also doing a lot of research within the office, especially about timber building. I'm going to show some projects about this, uh, but also life cycle analysis and energy efficiency and uh, housing well being and empirical housing studies, um, which also then translates into some publications uh, we've been working on. Um, mostly on the topic of housing, as you can see, um, during the last couple of years, which also then feed back into our practical work uh, in the office. Um, I would not spend too much time setting the prologue because I think uh, the conference as a whole did a very good job on that. Um, I just want to kind of explain to you what is important uh, to me when I uh, design buildings. And nowadays, I mean, the, the biggest challenge uh, to us as a society, but also to the uh, discipline of architecture, obviously, is uh, climate change. And I think uh, during the Fridays of Future um, demonstration, it was the first time that it really grab the intention of the whole society. And I think this is a very important momentum for us, um, but also it is a kind of indicator uh, how far things are progressing and how much uh, we need to work on this problem. But the climate change obviously is only one of many problems which are also addressed in the conference uh, by, my, um, by the other lectures. And uh, resource depletion, the destruction of ecosystems, and uh, all the results of our modern lifestyles, uh, which uh, contrast the Earth ecosystem's ability to absorb our uh, emissions and extractions, need to be addressed. And this study 
um, the great acceleration by Will Stephens and his co-authors shows how much uh, during the last 50 years, uh, the, uh, all those trends have been accelerating with an ex um, with a exponential growth. And I think this is very important and we have to keep that in mind when we uh, think about what we do in the future. And um, I really like this quote from Cedric Price, technology is the answer, but what is the question? Because to me that describes uh, a lot uh, very uh, in a very intelligent way what is happening was happening during the last decades in that um, we are very technology driven and uh, we always think of technology being the solution to our problems and if you think about the trends that followed those uh, technologies in the last slide then it's obvious that uh, there's a gap between the means and the ends, which is kind of what I would like to think about during the next uh, 50 minutes with you. Um, for Cedric Price, um, at this, um, at this uh, um, point in history, uh, the, the main thing was that architecture is not uh, an end in itself, that it is really an conversation and a kind of stage set for interaction and culture to take place in, um, which I think it's still a very Pence. valid point. Yes? Pence, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt. I think you you are seeing the presentation in full screen, but we can't see it here. We are seeing the PowerPoint. Oh, so that, maybe you are sharing that, the wrong window. And no, I'm not sharing the wrong window, but can you see it now? now yeah. Yeah, it moved now, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm sorry about that. If you have any technical problems, don't hesitate to stop me. So this is Cedric Price uh, I was quoting before. Um, and uh, this is uh, his Fun Palace project, uh, which is probably the most prominent one um, to explain this idea of uh, architecture being an interactive stage set for culture and human interaction. Um, but this is very different from what we experience uh, with technology in our everyday life, uh, uh, working as architects, because uh, there we have the feeling that uh, technology developed a kind of life in itself. And many of the modern buildings uh, inside look like this. They have an enormous complexity of uh, technology within them, which is very difficult to be controlled and mostly driven by regulations and uh, standards of comfort that users expect. And um, mo from my point of view, often are also the result of a lack of understanding uh, what we actually want to achieve with the buildings and what we actually do in the planning process. And this translates to um, the, the fact that the, um, the percentage of the budget that goes into the technical equipment um, has been risen dramatically during the last 20 years. Uh, this is a graph which applies only for Germany, but I'm pretty sure that it will not be much different in other European or uh, North American countries, um, showing that uh, the cost of buildings constructions are still rising faster than the general inflation expressed by the consumer price index. Um, but the cost of the building cons uh, of the technical building equipment has been rising dramatically, tripled in the same period of time, which shows that uh, our buildings are becoming much more complex and filled with the technology, which is very hard to control. And sometimes it would be very difficult to explain uh, why we need all this technology and uh, it is very uh, difficult to um, explain how to control this within the design process and what I'm trying to do in this lecture is 
to explain where we at DGJ uh, found ourselves uh, between the last 15 years and what we are trying to do um, in, the, in our current projects. Um, Rainer Benham in this uh, very recommendable book from uh, 1969, um, The Well-Tempered Environment in Architecture, uh, used this um, metaphor of uh, the sailing boat uh, to describe what he thinks should the building do, that they really use the uh, environmental forces to kind of uh, be a very uh, self-sufficient and elegant structure rather than, um, you know, the, the fossil oil-driven uh, motor vessel, which kind of uh, doesn't want and doesn't try to be elegant and uh, be in a kind of balanced relation to its environment, but it just uses brute force uh, to do what it's doing. And um, to this end, uh, the thesis of this lecture is that uh, we need to think of the design of the building and the construction and the energy concept and the technology, technological systems as one system rather than a combination of different components which do not correspond. And uh, we in DGJ or I myself have been on a journey um, from high-tech approaches to low-tech and no-tech approaches during the last 15 years or so. And I want to explain with uh, just three or four projects uh, how this journey, um, how, what this journey was. Um, I started uh, to work in the um, energy efficient building department at the Technical University um, in 2004, because I was really um, at the time coming to the conclusion that the way we operate and we build our buildings is in a stark opposition to uh, the ecosystems of the earth. And then, um, with the Hurricane Katrina in 2005 and the popularization of climate change in 2006 and the years past, um, the, it was pretty clear that uh, we need fundamental change uh, to the way we design and operate our buildings. And the first project I had the good fortune to uh, work on was the Soda de Casson building in 2009. This is a a uh, competition which takes place, I think, every other year, uh, where 20 small um, plus energy buildings are built between 20 international universities. And this is our contribution to the 2009 competition. And what is really is exciting about those projects is that they, um, it's a really a design build project in the university. That means a team of students uh, design, construct, and build the buildings on their own. And um, for this uh, competition, 2009, we built the building in Darmstadt University um, and then had to put it together within five days' time on the National Mall in Washington, DC. And for this project, we uh, invented a couple of features which enabled the building to perform uh, the way it did in the end. And part of it was that we decided that we want the whole facade of the building to be uh, uh, made from photovoltaics and therefore producing en energy. Um, and also we used those photovoltaics elements as a shading system um, in front of the windows because during September in Washington DC, overheating of the building is still the biggest challenge to um, the energy concept. And to this end, we also developed a semi-passive um, um, uh, cooling system, which is integrated into the cavities of the ceiling. Um, you can see, um, those plastic uh, profiles into which uh, face changing materials is integrated. These materials have a melting point around 26 degrees. That means um, when you pump 
uh, air with a higher temperature through those channels, then they will melt the substance within the profiles. And through this melting process, uh, they can absorb enormous amounts of heat energy through the transformation between the solid and the liquid stage. And this whole system is only driven by a, a very small a set of very small fans uh, which are used to pump the air actively through those channels. And the nice uh, thing about this is no, no, not only consumes almost no energy at all for the electricity of the fans that is, but also it could be integrated into this view of um, into this uh, surface of the ceiling. So you would not see any technology in the building. And uh, through those features, we managed to um, reach a huge surplus um, of energy during the operation of the building um, because it was so uh, efficient. Um, in DGJ, after this um, kind of prototype building, we also transferred this into everyday life, so to say. I mean, this is still a model uh, building, as uh, Tiago was saying, uh, for uh, the Federal uh, Institute of Building Technology. Uh, they made a series of 39 plus energy buildings throughout the country, and this is one of those. And uh, to achieve this plus energy standard, um, we decided that first we really want to uh, look at the passive means. We want to think about what can design, what can building construction, what can a clever placement of windows and, um, and circulation contribute to reducing the energy uh, consumption of the building uh, so that then only a very small fraction would need to be covered by the active systems. And for example, in this building for the boarding school, I mean, the site was limited, obviously, and uh, therefore the maximum uh, amount of energy we could produce with any PV system on the roof was also limited. And therefore we decided that we really want to uh, reduce the heated area of the building uh, in order to reduce the amount of energy that the building would consume overall. And the first decision was therefore that we would put all the circulation spaces outside the building in this open corridor, um, which not only doesn't use any energy uh, throughout the year, but also it creates a kind of balcony for the students to meet and to hang out. Uh, which is a kind of extra feature which was not um, asked for in the initial uh, room program, so that this is a kind of synergy we are looking for, that we save energy and at the same time create a, 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 a surplus for the users. And after this, uh, we uh, then used very efficient um, building technology, in this case, we used a heat pump, which was uh, used a solar collector in the south facade as a heat source um, to produce the hot water and the heating. And we implemented a huge uh, photovoltaic system in the roof, which uh, produces a lot of more energy than the building would use for its operation throughout the year. Um, those buildings um, are obviously uh, impressive as they are, but they also need a lot of um, high-tech building equipment, as you might guess from looking at those sketches. And the downside of, the, uh, of all this complexity is that it has a ten tendency to fail during operation due to uh, failures in the installation, which then need to be uh, fixed uh, during the operation or because of the users are kind of overwhelmed by the complexity of the system. And therefore, um, we were, are increasingly looking into passive systems which use less uh, building technology. Um, and therefore, the building construction is getting a more important part of the energy concept. But there's another reason why uh, the building construction is also getting increasingly important, which is if the building um, is getting more and more efficient, then at one point 
um, all the possibilities for um, re uh, increasing the efficiency of the building will be exhausted when you reach the point where the building produces as much energy, energy as it's used during operation. And then obviously you can and should uh, concentrate on um, reducing the embedded energy in the building construction. And I think we saw a lot of interesting examples for this uh, throughout the last uh, two, two days. And I would like to explain a little bit a uh, kind of holistic approach we tested with this so-called minimum impact house in Frankfurt, which was not only looking at the operation of the building and the building construction, but also at the mobility. Um, because one thing we uh, were thinking about at the time was that uh, if you think about where to build new housing, then um, obviously, um, building new houses within the city center where you have all the public transport and very good infrastructure induces a lot less uh, traffic than it would uh, if you build in suburbia where people need to travel to work, to school and for shopping. And therefore we try to look into ways how we could uh, produce new housing within the dense city center of Frankfurt. And uh, this, uh, since Frankfurt is also a very densely populated city, we also had to invent new housing typologies. And uh, we were at the time looking often to those Japanese mini houses, which use very small parcels of land to develop surprisingly generous architecture. And we also uh, developed this idea of the vertical housing rather than the horizontal uh, arrangement of the apartments and using those vertical spaces to create uh, generosity within the apartment, which you would not um, expect if you just look at the plans and the size of the plot and the size of the building. And um, as a result of uh, this, um, and, and another part of this study was also that we try to optimize the embedded energy of the building using timber construction, which at the time when this building was uh, constructed was very novel in Germany. Actually, you couldn't, uh, until 2006, you could not use timber for more than three stories. And this is the first building in Hesse, which was uh, using a timber construction for a five-story building. Um, and as a, a as an energy system, we also used a heat pump, which was connected to the outside air, which is a kind of reasonable uh, solution for this very low energy consumption that you would have for such a small building. Um, as a result, <clears throat> we could um, demonstrate with this prototype building that we could do, reduce um, CO2 emissions and primary energy emissions to a third of a conventional building in the suburbs. And most of it would still be induced not through the building or its operation itself, but through the mobility and um, the different location of the building. Um, and after this, um, it became increasingly um, clear to me that uh, the building construction and timber in particular is a kind of key technology um, to the building sector. And um, this is also um, un un um, undermined, underlined by a study which was published by Yale University and the Potsdam Institute for uh, climate um, in uh, which was uh, published last year. And interestingly, um, this whole idea that really the building sector is, uh, they, they were saying it's the elephant in the room because it accounts for around 40% of the global uh, CO2 emission and 55% of the uh, waste. Um, and uh, this, um, enormous contribution to the problem uh, could be made to an advantage as shown in this study by the Potsdam Institute and Yale University, if you really switch for future buildings to uh, timber construction, because 
timber as uh, indicated by uh, the other contributions in the lecture series uh, today and yesterday, uh, has the ability to absorb uh, atmospheric um, carbon into the building construction and therefore forming a carbon sink rather than um, a, a carbon emissions. And uh, it was um, calculated by the study from Yale that if we actually could transform our building sector to the degree that we uh, build 90% of all future buildings in timber, then we would create a carbon sink big enough to reduce um, the temperature rise globally to the Paris goal of 1.5 degrees. Um, I don't think this is realistic anytime soon, but we would like to contribute by uh, developing new building technologies which can be um, uh, used en masse and therefore we did uh, spend a lot of time researching new build, uh, timber technologies which are based basically on traditional um, carpentry. Um, we analyzed um, especially Japanese carpentries to understand how they produced and how they work but also for me as an architect, very interestingly, how this type of construction translates into architecture, translates into architect, uh, architectural ideas of spaces and how you live and uh, how um, you combine uh, construction and spaces into one kind of system. This is something that impresses me very much about traditional Japanese architecture. Um, we then conducted two uh, adjacent research projects uh, trying to translate this uh, press fit um, timber construction to traditional um, Japanese um, carpentry into modern building technology using CNC uh, milling, which is already available in almost every um, timber company in Germany. And um, this is the, one of the details we developed uh, to translate this traditional uh, detail into a modern one. Um, and here you can see how the columns uh, connect to the beam and then to the timber ceiling. And this is the uh, first application of this building system for a project I'm going to show later a little bit more detail of. Um, and what we try to do with that is to really develop a building system which can be used by anyone. Um, and we even provided a calculational tool so that uh, during the design process, you can make your own calculations quite quickly to get the dimensions of those uh, timber members. Um, we also thought about how this could be um, translated into a more sophisticated production process. And here I collaborated with the Technical University in Stuttgart. Uh, Professor Menges um, is an expert in this digital uh, robotic fabrication. And um, what we wanted to achieve with this project is that we not only um, apply this technology to the primary structure of the building, but we also include all the other um, requirements, especially uh, insulation and air tightness that modern building would need to have. And we developed this system, which is uh, in the end based on the idea of a block or lock cabin um, building, but is uh, rotated so that the main structure is uh, oriented vertically and each of the members is um, equipped with these uh, air cavities, which then slow down the heat transmission through the building so that the, um, these 40 centimeters solid timber walls would also um, uh, fulfill all the requirements in terms of insulation and um, air tightness. This was also a project which was done um, by uh, students. Um, the design and the building of the building 
um, is done in the collaboration between two universities where I was teaching in Oldenburg at the time and the University of Stuttgart. And uh, what is really interesting why I show this video is because uh, this um, technology leads to uh, simplicity in uh, the construction of the building. It is a bit complicated to design and to produce, but once you have the elements, it is really like a 3D puzzle, which could be put together within a few hours by untrained workers. And I think this is a very interesting um, road to explore uh, that we use new um, fabrication and planning methods to um, uh, uh, to use uh, to achieve this more sustainable um, building technologies. And this is the prototype building we built at the IBA in Thüringen. There's also an international building exhibition in Thüringen nowadays. And uh, this is what the building look, uh, looks inside. And here you can also see that uh, there is an interesting relation between the materiality and the production and the kind of space that we, you would get from the building. Um, the last third of the lecture, I would like to talk about uh, what I call no tech um, uh, strategies, which may, means to me what can design or what can we do without um, the use of um, of using any technology, but just thinking about the clever use and design of the building. And here, um, one very important uh, aspect nowadays is the so-called rebound effect. And to explain this, um, I mean, most of you probably know already what rebound means, but to explain it, I use this example from the car industry. Um, in 1957, uh, Fiat introduced this really cute Fiat 500 model, uh, which at the time was quite efficient, just using 4.5 liters of uh, fuel for 100 kilometers. And then um, obviously everybody knows cars getting bigger, security and comfort standards rising. Um, that means the model that Fiat introduced in 2007 was much bigger, much heavier, had a higher uh, top speed, obviously, and the higher security levels and everything. But in the end, all this uh, technological progress of these 50 years uh, have been absorbed by all these rising standards, translating into uh, the same fuel consumption 50 years later as the model um, before. Um, we have the same effect in architecture. And the most significant uh, number I like to quote for that is the um, floor area that we use for housing in Germany. Uh, that would have uh, increased between the 60s, which was still post-war times and quite uh, obviously not very comfortable. Uh, 19 square meters per person to nowadays we are talking about 47 square meters per person. And obviously that absorbs a lot of uh, the gains in efficiency that we achieved uh, throughout the last couple of uh, decades. And uh, this chart, which looks a bit complicated, um, shows that uh, rebound effect in uh, architecture quite well. Uh, we have the red line, which shows that the buildings are getting increasingly efficient using less and less heat uh, energy for per square meter uh, for the he heating. But at the same time, you get the green line that the living area per capita is going up and up and up, resulting in the effect that the energy demand for heating um, per capita is uh, only is more or less constant throughout the last 30 years and will only uh, go down in the next 20 years respectively, um, only if uh, the living area per capita does not rise any further. And um, I did a lot of research about affordable housing um, and I found a very interesting synergy between this social question of affordability and this ecological question of um, 
resource demand and CO2 emissions. And therefore, uh, that is a field that we focused on in DGJ that we were trying to um, explore where what we can contribute in terms of affordability and um, um, more sustainable housing in terms of energy demand, reducing basically um, the floor area without reducing the um, comfort of living. And the project I want to show you is the project I mentioned before when I was talking about the timber system. It's a student housing we did uh, as part of the international building exhibition in Heidelberg. Um, it's a uh, um, building for 176 students and includes not only the housing, but also workshops and uh, uh, a huge aula, which could be used as a lecture hall or for concerts and parties, and is also uh, understood as a kind of institution for um, education of young people. And the interesting part for us is uh, that uh, this was a project which is initiated by a group of uh, students really, and there's no commercial or public investor behind it. So we were uh, directly uh, discussing the way that uh, people would live with the people involved in it. And obviously, uh, given this setup, and uh, there was very little money to realize this building, and everything we had would, had to be raised from crowdfunding. So we had to be super careful with the building budget. And uh, therefore, we uh, discussed with the clients how could we reduce the um, amount of uh, the, the size of the apartments without uh, reducing the standard of living. And what we came up with is a system where you could flexibly um, adjust within the apartment the amount of area that would be used individually or that would be shared between you and your flatmates. And there's a small animation I would like to show you, which shows that um, for one thing, uh, you get the rough idea of how this building system works, you get those uh, a skeleton from timber and then you had those flexible walls within those uh, and then you could decide that either you just uh, want a seven square meter room to yourself and then the shared area within the apartment would be bigger or the other way around if you grow your individual space then you would reduce uh, shared space in the apartment and all this could be negotiated between all the people that share the flats so that seemed to be very interesting to us um, and the uh, invention at this point is for one thing that uh, those partition walls but also the furniture of the building will be built by the users themselves and therefore they will be also in the uh, capable of changing this when they are not happy with the current setup during the operation of the building. But we would also wanted to test uh, if this seven square meter room actually would work for the clients. So we built uh, a, a, a prototype room, which we could also use to test this um, self-built technology. And here the idea was also uh, a bit like in the large scale of the building where you would have a 3D puzzle of the timber members. You would also have a 3D puzzle of those um, um, furnitures, which is basically uh, 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 um, exploration of the uh, or implementation of the wiki house system, which also uses CNC milling and the flat panel um, architecture. Um, we also wanted to articulate this ever changing life inside the building to the outside. So we were using those uh, screens on the outside, which uh, can be used as a shading, but also uh, change the appearance of the building throughout the day and throughout the year. Uh, the building is now almost completed and will be ready to be used uh, within the next uh, weeks. Actually, it's supposed to be finished by uh, next April. And one other thing um, I wanted to um, explain about this project is the energy concept. 
um, together with our partner um, that were able to do this dynamic uh, building situation, we uh, figured out that through the high density of people within the building, um, the heat demand of the building is, neglect uh, is almost neglectable. So um, what we figured out is that throughout the year, you would have very little, um, very little heat demand and very little overheating depending on your standards. If you um, were willing to accept more hours of overheating and uh, of um, undercooling, say, then you would um, be able to operate the building without an active heating system. And what we suggested to the client is to abandon any active heating system and just use small electrical radiators that would be only used throughout very limited periods in, of time throughout the year, only basically when there are not enough people inside the building to uh, heat up the building through their presence and the use of lighting and uh, appliances. Uh, in the end, this very interesting concept of a building without a heating could not be realized because the client entered into a contract uh, for the district heating when they bought the land. So the land had the obligation to connect to the district heating system, which is a mechanism to refinance this public uh, investment of the district heating. So we could not realize this concept, which would have been super exciting, obviously. Another passive technology we are currently exploring is um, uh, green facades. Uh, we design a building in Mannheim, which is like an hour's drive from Frankfurt, um, also for kind of community shared housing. And here our idea was that we uh, use a green facade uh, to uh, cool the building. And uh, we are currently conducting a study um, for this Federal Institute for Building Technology where we actually want to measure and quantify the cooling uh, or the shading effect of this green facade um, throughout the year and through the different directions. And to this end, we also build small prototypes of this facade, which then will be equipped with all sorts of measuring equipment in order to understand better what plants to be used and what uh, kind of uh, watering system you would need and what effect in terms of cooling and shading you could expect from that. And the last project I want to show you, uh, which is also in this realm of kind of passive technology using design rather than uh, active systems is a project uh, students of mine designed for uh, Senjian in China. Um, at the time I was teaching in Münster University of Applied Science, and we uh, established an exchange program with the campus in uh, Shenzhen, which is in South China, quite next to, uh, just next to uh, Hong Kong, actually. And it was very interesting because we were trying to address uh, the topic of affordable housing. As you might know, Shenzhen is one of those cities where you had uh, an, a huge influx of migrant workers um, because of all these uh, huge factories they have there to produce our smartphones and everything. Um, and most of those migrant workers at the time were living in those so-called um, urban villages, which are um, obviously quite affordable in themselves, but would not um, really fulfill all the um, requirements that we would have uh, when it comes to lighting, ventilation, or fire protection. So what we did in an international competition between Münster and, um, and Senjen was to find new solutions for this affordable housing for the migrant workers. And uh, one project um, I want to show you from this competition was using this idea of um, an analyzing the local climate and to understand exactly what you could use in terms of um, 
solar radiation, wind uh, directions, but also outside and inside temperature to understand better um, how to can use this uh, external climate climatic conditions uh, in order to keep the building comfortable throughout the year. And the idea here was that you have the building very clearly oriented uh, in a east-west direction so that the tropical sun, which comes mostly from the east or the west through the high sun pass, would only hit the small side of the building. And this uh, you would then use as a solar, uh, for a solar collector, which produces um, warm air throughout the year, which could be uh, filtered inside the apartments uh, through a kind of double floor. And um, then you would, sorry, uh, and then you would use uh, a, a, a double facade with um, mobile elements in the facade that would be driven by the wind in order to achieve a cross ventilation uh, throughout the hot uh, period of the year to use natural ventilation and shading to keep the building comfortable throughout the year. So this is a very quick overview, um, which kind of explains this journey from the very high-tech approach that we tested in the solar decathlon building and uh, the plus energy house we built in uh, for the uh, boarding school. Um, and then the increasing importance of the building construction with timber being a key technology in, in, in my point. And then the more uh, and more important uh, question of what do we design in terms of housing and how could we integrate uh, our understanding of the building construction and the energy concept into a kind of holistic idea of sustainable housing. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you, Hans, for your talk, really interesting. We're gonna, we still have some minutes for some questions from the audience. Does anyone want to ask something? Questions? No? No one? May I start? Uh, did you show many investigation about the how to build with wood, uh, studied connections? Do you do these studies with some industry as a partner? Yes, um, we had uh, two different engineering companies helping us with the research and also we have two different um, industry partner which also helped to uh, actually build those prototype building um, pieces. Um, so, uh, yes. Thank you. So, oh, sure. Here? Here in the front. We'll have a mic. Thank you for it work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank, you. thank you for a really interesting talk. I I very much like the the idea in the last project to 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 go completely without technical systems and to try to question our notion of standards. But uh, the problem that I experience is that there are very different perception about what standards are. And it's, uh, it's uh, incredibly hard to probably to impose or even to understand what then this mean, this average is. So as soon as you say, let's bridge this three, four, five days where it's objectively too cold with uh, electrical heating and you offer this possibility, then you expose the whole system to you know, misuse somehow. Because uh, as soon as you have too many people that feel that below 24 degrees it's not comfortable, you know, then you turn the no technical system into a very problematical technical system. How do you think about this? Or what, what possibilities would there be to, you know, to make sure that this then is also lived? There's no, no tech. Yeah, uh, thank you. Is, Sorry. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. That's actually something that I've been thinking about a lot. 
Um, I mean, we have the uh, good fortune that in our projects, because they are really bottom up projects where we uh, directly plan and design for the users who are going to live in the building. I mean, obviously, with the students' housing, we talk to a representative group um, of 30 people, and then in the end, there will be 176. But still, we could discuss with them about the risks um, that you would run. And to be honest, I mean, this was part of the, I mean, in the end, I had the feeling they were kind of relieved uh, when we found out that we could not do this low tech system without the heating because of this obligation for the district heating, because they also had the feeling that it might not work or what happens if it doesn't work. And your point being that if you only have this, um, the engineer of this uh, Lustenau building of uh, Baumschlager Ebele called those techniques a parachute. Yeah, he was saying that. In Lustenau, this is this building without heating, where they only operate with the internal gains, and then they have a kind of minimal uh, minimal fallback being the lighting or something. I forgot. And he called that a parachute. And obviously, the parachute is good if you fall once, but as you were saying, if you use the parachute, uh, I don't know, three months a year, then you have a problem because it's not designed for that and it's very inefficient. My uh, feeling is that we need to, and that is something uh, I think it's getting increasingly important, important that we not think about uh, just today, but that we think about adaptable technology that we say, okay, we try this now and maybe there's a way that we can change the system if we, uh, if we really figure out that it doesn't work. And uh, this low tech systems have the advantage that uh, the investment is very small so if you then figure out okay i need to do something to the system to kind of upgrade it then this could be maybe justified by the low investment in the first place but i i, I totally see your point and i think this is something that we really need to keep in mind when we talk about these techniques uh, but to my knowledge i i mean i mostly know like germany switzerland and austria there are only very few buildings that actually test have tested that right now and i think there needs to be a lot of research to understand how those buildings work better and it's only in the last five ten years that we understood okay there is really this opportunity that we could build those buildings without technology and what happens then perfect more questions in the room no Ooh, I think we have one, one line. Um, since you are, we, you are using so much quantities of wood to build, is it sustainable to chop down so many trees to build a building? Uh, yeah, do they... Well, yeah, this is an online question. I think we know that the, there are forests that are <laughs> planted just for this. So wood is, for, of course, a sustainable industry. So I guess there's no, not really a dilemma here. But if you want to talk about it a little bit, it's okay. No, it's very interesting. I mean, what I found most interesting is that this is, I mean, I talk often in, in, in conferences or to, to, in different circumstances about timber building. And often I get this question, where's all the timber coming from? And interestingly, nobody would ask, where's all the concrete coming from? Or where's all the steel coming from? And uh, it, is, it is something that somehow seems to worry people more than it does with uh, things they see every day. Then you think that this might be infinite, even if you can read in the newspaper how sand is, uh, getting increasingly scarce and to, to make concrete and I mean obviously that the concrete and steel production being big part of the climate problem. Um, in Germany to answer this precisely uh, we have sustainable forestry since 1713 and it has been quite successful in really maintaining the forest as a source for uh, timber, but we are seeing a big change in uh, happening in the forest because what we have now is um, um, is not really good for the climate. It is mostly I don't know English word fichte. It's a special kind of uh, fir tree, I think it is, and they uh, 
don't are not very resistant against the higher temperatures. So the uh, the forest really needs remodeling and needs to be changed to a more resilient um, kind of mixed forest in the next decades. There is uh, obviously much to do uh, if we want, especially if we want to achieve this 90% of timber buildings that uh, Yale University is talking about. So it's a valid, very valid point um, and it should not be put aside. Perfect, thank, thank you. you. So, any more questions here in the audience? No? Uh, yeah, so one so, more in the front. The last one. Hi, Enz. Um, I don't know if it's a question or it's more a comment about it. I, after your presentation, I realize it's gonna be much harder for us as Europeans or probably cold countries to be sustainable because I think the, hard, uh, the hardest job is to find ways to, to control temperature, I think, in, in sustainability. I don't know if it's this a question or probably you can talk about it a little bit, because for warm countries it's probably easier to get sustainable. Um, how do you see this in the future? Do you think it's gonna be a harder job for cold countries to get sustainable more than the warm countries? Uh, no, actually, I would disagree. What we experience from our building, and this is what I try to explain with this uh, student housing in Heidelberg, is that the heating is really not the problem of the building. It is very little he uh, energy demand for the heating itself. Most, I mean, the domestic hot water is, uh, has a bigger energy demand than the heating of the building. And I think uh, that, that the cooling can be uh, just as much a challenge in the warm countries as we have the heating in, in colder countries. I think that's an equal challenge. Uh, and uh, the one problem that I observe in Germany is that uh, due to the higher summer temperatures and people not being used to that and the building not being, being designed for this kind of temperatures, uh, we also start talking about air conditioning, uh, housing and offices increasingly uh, in Germany, which is something that 10 years ago, nobody would even discuss uh, for more than five minutes in a meeting. But nowadays it's something that really comes up depending on the standard of housing you're talking about and offices. Yeah, perfect, thank you. So Hans, thank you very much for being with us. Yeah, it was thank a pleasure you very much for having thank me. Thank you. That was fantastic. We, well, great. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. Bye.